Hello again and how are we all? Alright, so it's been about six months since my last review video. About nine months since I last did a book review. So, hopefully now these are going to be a little more regular. Now, I've wanted to do this particular one for quite a while, but um, due to this and that and stuff, I wasn't able to do it until now. But, coincidentally, for this particular title, it is the 40th anniversary. Okay, you've seen the title, Why Keep It In Suspense? So join me now, as I dive in and review. Just a quick note before we proceed, if you haven't read the book, there will be spoilers. There's also going to be some from the film in this review. So if you're not comfortable with that sort of thing, go away, read, watch the movie, and then come back to this. Okay? Awesome. Originally released in 1974 and re-released in July 2012, Jaws is the granddaddy of all shark-related movies and books to this very day. It should be noted at this early point that Jaws was inspired by the real shark attacks which happened in 1916 across the coast of New Jersey and up Matawan Creek, which later became known as the Summer of the Sharks. So there's a little bit of trivia there for all of you watching. Now, everyone has seen the film from 1975 directed by Steven Spielberg, which went on to not only create the summer blockbuster as we know it, but also terrified audiences by tapping into one of our most primal fears, where we are out of our element and completely at the mercy of something we don't even see approaching. But with the huge success of the film, the novel that inspired it is more often forgotten and not in the public consciousness as a result, despite it being a bestseller for some 44 weeks and the subsequent paperback version selling millions of copies the following year. So with that introduction out of the way, let's begin our analysis, shall we? So now for a brief plot synopsis. Now the story begins with a very detailed description of the shark itself and its sensory array as it approaches the small community of Amity Island. Just as two teenagers wander onto the beach, and one passes out, while the other, Christy Watkins, decides to go for a skinny dip, and is subsequently attacked and killed by the shark. Now, the next morning, we see the introduction of our main character, Chief Martin Brody, who is called out to investigate Christy's disappearance and file a report to which he writes down as the cause of death as a shark attack to which Brody wants to close the beaches as a precaution against more possible future attacks. However, he is overruled by the mayor, Larry Vaughan, and the town selectman. During this time, the population of Amity Island are preparing for their summer visitors, and the famed 4th of July celebration, which creates the island's profit and business that sustains them through the winter months. It is also during this time that another attack happens on a young boy called Alex Kidner and an old man. When this happens, panic ensues across Amity and sparks a manhunt for the shark responsible. Seeing both the residents of Amity and people from the mainland taking part, uh, while some come to the island for a glimpse of the killer shark. And that's your brief plot synopsis. Let's begin a real analysis. Book versus movie. Now, while the movie follows the plot of the novel to quite an extent, there is a difference between the two of them. The first is the overall focus of the story, whereas in the movie, the shark is the main focus of the narrative. In the novel, it's completely the opposite, where the characters are in the spotlight, and they get much more in the way of characterization and development. One example of this comes from Chief Brody himself. 
While in the movie, Brody comes across as your typical average Joe family man with a supportive marriage. In the book, however, his personality is more or less the complete opposite of the depiction we see in the movie. Personally, from my perspective, he comes off as a guy who is frustrated, somewhat embittered, and tired of his day-to-day -day life, and all the problems he has to deal with in the community of Amity. This characterization of Brody becomes most obvious during his interactions with his wife, Ellen, who, interestingly enough, gets a lot of exposition for her character, where we, the readers, learn that she came from a well-off family and other parts of her life before she met Brody and had her children. On that note, in the film, we get two kids, Sean and Michael Brody. In the book, there's actually three. There's Michael, Sean, and Martin Jr. Wonder why they cut out Martin Jr. It's never really explained anywhere. Anyway, when Ellen becomes the focus for one of the underlining subplots of the book, where she has an affair with Matt Hooper, who, as it turns out, is the younger brother of a guy she used to date, it is here that the setup of the story takes on the dynamics of what I can only describe as a really bad soap opera. Later on, there are a couple of passages which describe her marital transgression that involve her rape fantasies. I'll be honest here, it is quite cringe-inducing. Now, I was used to the depiction in the movie. This, reading this, was like being slapped in the face with a wet fish. Moving on. That said, however, the book does have a few other melodramatic set pieces, such as the heated, cliched exchanges between Brody and the town selectman. And there are other set pieces in the book that, sadly, are so stilted and wooden, it leaves you thinking why didn't the editor be a bit more aggressive in limiting the overall page count. An example of this comes during a dinner sequence that is indeterminable in length and its only function seems to be the listing of the amount of alcohol that Brody can, can, can drink in about an hour. And there's also a recounting of the recipe for butterfly lamb. That being said, there's a few other things I want to address here as well. Going back to the character focus, now as I said earlier in this review, the characters are at the forefront of the story over the killer shark, which is good because they get more fleshed out. This includes characters who, in the film, only got brief appearances, most notably the journalist Harry Meadows, who here serves as the damage control who hushes up about the shark attacks at first, but later uncovers the secret behind Mayor Larry Vaughn and his silent partners, which turn out to be members of the Mafia, who are also putting pressure on Vaughn to keep the beaches open despite the attacks and against what might be perceived as Vaughn's better judgement, as they have invested in Amity's real estate and want to keep the values high. Vaughn also wants to keep them open anyway because he wants to use bits of the profit to pay back the Mafia. Most likely because of their influence he is in the mayor's position, which in itself is interesting. Other characters who do get changes include Matt Hooper, who in the film, through Richard Dreyfuss's portrayal, is one of the most charming characters I have ever seen in a movie. In the book, however, Matt Hooper is can only be described as a snotty, well-to-do Ivy League maniac, ego maniac, and is generally unlikable as a character, I feel anyway. Quint also gets an added level to him as well, mainly in the form of conflict between himself and Brody, mainly following the discovery of what Quint uses as bait to attract the shark. In the film he used legal chum, in the book, however, he uses something a little less legal, in the form of unborn dolphin fetuses, which I'll be honest I felt a bit sickened by. 
Another character who gets a bit of exposition is Hendrix. Now, for those of you who may not remember Hendrix specifically, he is one of the deputies that work along with Brody. In the book, he has a more active role. At one point, he even tries to save an old man who is being attacked by the shark, not long after the fatal attack on Alex Kidner. Now, something else I have to address here is what I can only describe as subplot stupidity. While I found the whole element of Mayor Vaughan and the Mafia an interesting addition to the book, the others not so much. The problem I feel they have is it just doesn't feel as engaging. Um, with Ellen having the affair with Hooper for the most part, now I'll admit I was of two minds about this. Because, yep, she's cheating on her husband, but on the other hand, after reading through it, you feel it's kind of justified because Brody treats her like crap. I get the focus on Ellen is to give the story more of an edge, which makes it somewhat reminiscent of something Ira Leving, of Stepford Wives fame, may have written, or to some extent a less illiterate J.D. Ballard. The bored housewife, the problems with aging, having affairs, feeling unloved, all the cliches are present. And from that, I would like to talk a little bit about the themes. Interestingly, throughout, there is a strong element of fear throughout the novel. Brody's own fear of his fading virility. Ellen's own fear that she's missed out on chances in her life to be happy. But curiously enough, there's very little tension when it comes to the actual shark. And this again may be because of a lack of empathy on my part, with Benchley's characters in all respects. It should also be noted at this juncture that there is a disturbing undercurrent of misogyny, along with racist and homophobic undertones, which perhaps is because it's keeping in the spirit of the times of the early 70s, which would make sense, but it is worryingly significant throughout. Now we talk a little bit about the ending. Now, the ending in the book, to me, felt very abrupt and anticlimactic, as the shark stops within inches of attacking Brody on board the sinking orca, after it succumbs to its wounds inflicted earlier by Quint with a bunch of harpoons, who coincidentally gets his leg wrapped up by a rope on one of the harpoons and is dragged under by the shark and drowns. A less climactic ending compared to the oxygen tank and rifle we got in the movie. Overall, I would say that Jaws the novel, it's admittedly a surprising light read, where I'll admit it is difficult to reread it without this popping into your head, which is damaging because it further highlights the shortcomings and inherent problems the book has, and it provides an unfair contrast, and this is very unfortunate as the core text of the story is done to such a dilated degree that you as the reader grow not to care for the characters to the extent that I personally wanted the shark to somehow eat every single one of them in turn. That being said, however, Jaws is a novel that plays to the obvious and compares extremely poorly with the film. The ideas are good, but the execution leaves something to be desired in the book, whereas in the movie, it's just done much better. The problem is, Spielberg, you did it too damn good. You ruined it. You ruined it for Benchley, man. So, that was a relatively short review, but there we have it. My review of Jaws by Peter Benchley. So, I'm interested in your thoughts. If you've read the book, what did you think of it? Did you enjoy it over the movie? Please share your thoughts and ideas in the comments section down below. Or tweet me at MikeyMitch24. Right, that should pretty much wrap this up. If you liked my video, 
them. If you liked my review, please hit that like button, share it with your friends and family if you should feel so inclined. If you like the content I put out, why not show it by subscribing to my channel? Right, that pretty much wraps up the video. Next time I take a big bite out of an even bigger shark. The special anniversary edition of Meg by Steve Alton. So thank you very much for watching and until next time, see ya!